Thank you very much, Philip, and thanks, George, as well, for opening up that conversation. And I think one of the challenges for us as we move on through this debate about what does in decolonialising and in, in um, social work and what does Indigenous um, practice mean, um, at one level, it may just mean seeing myself in the examples, seeing myself in the way that things are, are discussed and talked about, seeing my context. Um, but there may be other things and deeper philosophical changes which we need to discuss and then we need the words. Um, so we need the critique of, of the words that are used in the codes of ethics and in um, other places and, and have discussion about that to see um, how we can move. But we'll come back to this, I'm sure, in, in the panel later. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you're seeing me at this point. Um, uh as we're we're talking um yeah yeah it's fine you are good okay my my screen is telling me that i'm seeing you philip but um, anyway that, that's <laughs> that's unfortunate for you but uh, we can see you <laughs> no. we can see you very well <laughs> good good so now we're moving into the next panel i see uh, linda kreitzer is um, sitting there in edmonton um so let me just introduce you and your your uh, colleagues um linda um, Linda is um, adjunct professor in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Calgary, based in Edmonton. But for this purpose, she's coordinating a, a really significant team that's looking at um, some documents from the Association of Schools of Social Work in Africa um, through the 60s and, and 70s. And um, there's uh, Yasana uh, Mohamed Nundin Musa, um, who's assistant lecturer um, at the University of Calgary as a PhD student, but also based in Ghana. And Genestic Mwende uh, Twikiris, um, sorry, Genestic, uh, got, got your surname wrong there, but senior lecturer, um, a very well known figure in international social work based at Makerere University in, uh, in Uganda. Um, so it's nice to see friends and colleagues here, um, but they're going to talk to us for around uh, half an hour about um, the fascinating archive from this uh, organization. Linda's told me about it, and I won't say much more except to say that it existed in a very strong way for a period, but then disappeared and is now being rediscovered. And um, Linda is going to tell us about the project and with her colleagues. And I should say Antoinette Lombard is also here. Um, Antoinette is um, in uh, Pretoria. Uh, the University of Pretoria has been a very significant person. Hello, Antoinette, um, working on the Global Agenda for Social Work with me and um, with others also very well known in the International Association of Schools of Social Work is part of the team, but um, is, there, is here today to support. Linda, over to you. And we're really looking forward to hearing about this um, um, lost archive. Thank you very much, David. And thank you, Philip and everybody there um, on this uh, really important uh, conference. I'm just going to bring up um, the PowerPoint uh, that we're going to share with you. Uh, and there, okay. Okay, so, um, You've, we've, uh, I've introduced, uh, David's introduced the team. There are more people on this team, um, including Tasse Abbey and Valerie Udra Ago <laughs> um, and Ziblam Abukari. And uh, they were not able to be here today, but they are definitely, you know, really important figures in this, in this uh, research. Okay, so I am going to, uh, Yasana is now going to give a little bit of a history of uh, the Association of Social Work Education in Africa. Are you there, Yasana? Okay, I guess he may have been booted out. He's having trouble with his um, with his uh, internet connection. I did I did see him there earlier, um, Linda. But okay, perhaps the connection has has gone. Just quickly scrolling through. No, he, he's, is he muted? 
No, he's not muted. He's not in the okay. list of participants That's... at the moment. Okay. Okay, so what we uh, started out with, uh, this project has been going on for 22 years, so uh, this has been a long process, but uh, we have a, a, a symbol here, it's a Dinkra symbol, and the Dinkra symbol is part of Ghana's history, and it's called Sankova, and Sankova means the importance of learning from the past, the importance of looking back at the past to see what happened there so that we could move forward in the future. So this presentation, uh, we're gonna give a brief history leading up to the Association of Social Work Education in Africa or ASWIA as we call it uh, and its formation and, um, and purpose and specifics about the content of these documents and the initial learning from our analysis so far. So the historical context of social work in Africa, uh, as, as we see it, is uh, social care has been an integral part of African society for thousands of years through the kinship systems, clans, elders, and extended family. However, colonialism changed that tradition and introduced social welfare systems that reflected colonial powers. The kinship system was weakened and social needs were met through colonial institutions and missionary organizations. And so when the African countries gained independence, the UN encouraged the importation of Western social work curriculum into African nations, and, and African nations wanted it as well. It was a two-way process. So to help the needy within these nations. Um, and the, the British colonies uh, introduced more the remedial uh, kind of social work, whereas the French uh, colonies uh, more focused on health and and youth needs. It's very brief, sorry. <laughs> so there was an assumption that Western social work curriculum could transfer to African social work programs with little change in the curriculum. Thus, African social work programs were, used, were using Western books, using Western case studies to teach social work practice in Africa. However, in the late 1960s, there was a growing um, understanding that not all Western theories and interventions were transferable. And a growing number of African academics were critically looking at the Western curriculum. And, and there began a process of wanting to change the curriculum then. And the, this, this progress really started in Ghana in 1962 at a conference, and then Zambia in 1963, and Egypt in 1965, and to move forward with this critique. And as a result of those conferences, a new social work association was formed in 1973 to address the issue of social work education in Africa. It was to be a guiding light to make social work education and practice relevant to the social issues in Africa. So I just wanna uh, briefly tell you what the purpose of the um, ASWIA was. Uh, to promote teaching and research in the field of social development in Africa, establish high standards and different levels of social work education, because there were many different levels that were happening at that time, and not always using the term social work. Promote the exchange of information and experience in social work education among social work educators. And to promote cooperation between schools of social work, institutions and centers offering social work education. Take an interest and identify problems connected with social work education in Africa. 
uphold the principles of universal human rights in collaboration with international organizations, and encourage social workers to promote popular participation through national social development planning. A very tall order for a, an association of any size. And uh, they took this quite seriously. So, uh, figure out, okay. So between 1973 and 1989, the organization held conferences, workshops, and produce surveys to address the lack of local case studies, the lack of knowledge of the history of African social work, and an independence, uh, sorry, a dependence on Western social work curriculum, and the lack of resources to fill the above gaps. Other concerns included the impact of the colonial legacy, national development planning and training staff, lack of local teaching material, inappropriate teaching styles, rural issues, and better use of social research. Well, this association had 34 African countries that were part members of, of this uh, group. It's probably the largest amount of countries that any association in Africa has ever seen. And I just wanna note that South Africa was not included in this association due to apartheid. 21 documents were produced from these conferences, workshops and working groups. All proceedings were typed and sent to member African universities. This association was supported very highly by international organizations and governments. So uh, Friedrich Ebert Steifong, UNICEF, Organization for African Unity, the UN Economic Commission for Africa was very involved. Uh, international Planned Parenthood, Canadian International Development Agency, IASSW, IFSW, and ICSW. And that's really to name a few, there were more. Governments that participated came from Ethiopia, Nigeria, Togo, Cameroon, Zambia, Egypt, Kenya, and Libya, either funding the organization or hosting workshops in their countries. And the secretariat was based in Ethiopia, in Addis. So I wanna go through each of these, uh, the, the 21 documents, um, just the title, so you can get a flavor of what was being talked about and discussed during this, these conferences. There were a few small ones before, the big ones that we can't find, the ones starred are ones we still can't find, but we've got a very small uh, document on the effort and community development in Lakota sub prefecture. Uh, so, and some of these are Lakota project, which I think was Ethiopia, I think. But the first one that we, we have looked at is the important role of supervision in social welfare organizations. The use of films in social development education, we can't find that. The guidelines for making contact with young people in informal groups in urban areas. And then, Amazingly, we have a compilation of case studies in social development from East Africa and from West Africa. And I have to say that that was very much encouraged by UNICEF to get those case studies. And each of those case studies gives the, 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 the scenario, what the intervention was 
and, and, and a reflection from the social worker or community worker of how they felt things went, good and bad. Uh, then we had a conference in Lome, a relationship between social work education and national development plan. So as, as countries were coming out of uh, colonial uh, or becoming independent, then it was really important that national planning and development was there. And that was very key for these first conferences in the 70s. How can social work become part of our national planning? We have a curricula of schools of social work training centers in Africa from 1974, with most countries uh, actually uh, in, in that directory. We have a directory of social welfare activities in Africa, the third edition in 1975. I don't know where the first and second are, but anyway, the third is there. Is there. Then we have the report of Azuia's workshop on techniques of teaching and methods of field work evaluations. Um, and, and we also have that, uh, that workshop in French in Cameroon. Little bit different take on it, but we're actually comparing those two. Then we have the social realities and the response of social work education in Africa, uh, proceedings from the third ASWIA conference in Addis, the role of social development education in Africa's struggle for political and economic independence. Then we have a series of development of a training curriculum in family welfare. This is a workshop. Uh, expert group in Addis and the same in French happened as well in, in the same year. Uh, there was guidelines for the development again of teaching of training curriculum and family welfare in Zambia. And I'm not going to uh, read the French because I'm not good at French. So there was also the same kind of thing in Togo. Uh, then in Addis, there was a social development training in Africa experiences in the 1970s and merging trends of the 80s. And then a survey, another survey of the curriculum of de social development training institutions in Africa. Then towards the end in the 80s, uh, looking more at the rural areas, uh, delivering services in rural areas. And uh, in 1985, I think was the last one. And that was training for social development methods of intervention to improve people's participation. So it's more participatory, rural transformation, but also emphasis on women. And then in 1989, there is kind of a summary or survey called social development agents in rural transformation. So those are the documents. They are 3,500 pages. So you can imagine how uh, time consuming this all is. Now, I came across these documents when I was doing my uh, social work um, PhD in Ghana and looking at curriculum there. And I was told about these. And when I returned to Canada, I actually went on the interlibrary loan and I found these documents all over the place, none in Africa, but all over the place and inquired whether my colleagues in Africa had ever seen these and the answer was no. And so for the next 10 years, I actually copy printed and bound them and gave sets of documents. There are six volumes in a set to different universities in Africa who had social work programs. We also put them online at the university in South Africa and we have CDs. And I wrote about them in my book, Social Work in Africa, Exploring Culturally Relevant Education and Practice in Ghana. And there's also a chapter in Mel Gray's Decolonizing Social Work that talks about these summaries, uh, the, these uh, documents. And here's just a picture of the documents and how they look in a hard copy and a CD. However, I was not satisfied with this because um, I 
knew that my summary and everything was from my perspective. And I wanted African academics to be able to analyze these documents and not, not just me. So I received a Canadian grant and the IASSW grant to analyze these documents through the eyes of African social work scholars. So we formed a team in 2019 to analyze these documents. And the goal was to write a guidebook for teachers in social work programs to explain the history of social work in Africa. So, so where, you know, this is history that we're not teaching. And so the team has been meeting for each month since 2020, and they each have a document they have to analyze and read, and then they present it to the team each month, and then we discuss it. And some of those documents, as you can see, were in French, and so we, we have both French and English speakers uh, analyze these, these, analyzing these documents because we also feel that the French francophone countries in Africa, you know, they, it, it feels like their Anglophone and Francophone are separate. It's, 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 they don't seem to be connecting at all. So um, I'm going to have Genestic now take, take it from here. Thank you so much, uh, Linda, and uh, for that uh, very uh, systematic exposure of uh, what, of the history. And uh, the team has already been introduced, the team that's been involved in this work. So I won't be uh, repeating that. If you can proceed, please. Yeah, so uh, as you, you could note from uh, Linda's presentation, you know, ASEA existed for 16 years from 1973 up to 1989. And then it suddenly disbanded in 1989 and split into several associations in Eastern and Southern Africa. Although these associations, if you ask me, they are really uh, less known. Yeah, so uh, uh, Linda already mentioned that we embarked on this project, you know, the analysis of these documents in 2019. So we are halfway through our analysis. And in June, this coming June, we shall be meeting in Kampala to look at the codes, the categories and themes highlighted in these documents. We've been recording all our meetings. We've been recording all the discussions and we shall be meeting face to face to go through all this. And we also plan to present uh, learnings that we've so far uh, picked from the documents at Makere University, you know, to get some feedback. We also intend to uh, invite the ASWA, the current Association of Schools of Social Work in Africa representative to join us in Kampala so that we can, uh, you know, compare the before and after situations and what ASWA could learn you know, from its predecessor. Our goal is to be able to give social work educators a tool to teach the history of social work education in Africa that is not dominated by the Western history. And in this way, we are contributing to the decolonization of social work education in Africa, and maybe the indigenization that has been discussed, you know, in the previous discussion before we came online. Publications will also be written about different parts of these documents because there's simply a lot of, you know, insights and learnings to pick from the documents. Next. So uh, we wanted to share initial learnings from these documents with you, the current audience. And uh, the number one learning is really that as you go through these documents, you realize that the same issues that they grappled with in that period of 1973 to 1989 are still being discussed today. You know, uh, an example is the issue of uh, indigenization and, you know, culturally relevant social work and all that. You know, when we are talking about it today, it seems as if, oh, this is a new debate, but we did realize that it actually was alive then as it is today. And the question we've asked ourselves is why have we not moved forward? 
why are we still discussing these things at this time? And a good selection, another lesson is that a good selection of African case studies are included in these documents. However, it seems there continues to be a short supply of African case studies being used in African social work programs today. And we haven't come across another compilation of probably recent case studies in, you know, to, to the best of our knowledge, at least from the, uh, the institutions that we represent as a team. And three is that the professional identity of social workers was linked to social development, the broader social, economic, and political contexts. The issue of terminology and professionalization were also important in these documents. How and when do we use the word social welfare or social development is you know, very uh, alive in those documents. How and when do we use the word social worker or community worker? And there seems to have been, you know, a preference for, you know, community worker or social development practitioner, uh, uh, social development uh, instead of social welfare. And then uh, there was also a critique of teaching styles with the traditional lecture method, you know, being critiqued seriously and with uh, uh, more participation between teacher and learner encouraged, you know, and both were being seen as learners. We came across uh, uh, what was presented as an innovative, you know, uh, teaching method called uh, group work, but the kind of group work that was being written about actually was more of theater involving role play and all that. And also that was presented as, you know, a more democratic approach to teaching. And then uh, we also noted that food supervision was prioritized for education and the relationships between the supervisor and student was specifically uh, addressed. Uh, food placement models included placing students in local communities and uh, in most cases they had to live with families. Uh, this association also had the most members of African countries ever, and this intrigued us. But as Linda uh, mentioned in her presentation, you could also see that you could also see that there were so many organizations, international and government, involved in this, and we kept wondering, you know, what exactly happened. Uh, this association embraced both Francophone and Ang Anglophone countries with translations offered at conferences. And this is also, we noted this as a point of de departure from the current association. So we need to learn how ASEA was established, how it was financed, and how it became inclusive of both French and English so that we can uh, have a better association as ASEA. Um, then we also learned, I've already mentioned, that national governments were directly involved, not only through financing, but direct participation. Uh, in some conferences, you see uh, ministers for social development and ministers from relevant departments actually being part of these conferences, in addition to the international associations, which seem to have been very interested and supportive of the association. Funding was provided to help establish and maintain the association, but eventually funding was withdrawn so that the Organization of African Unity could take responsibility for sustainability of the association. Uh, there are many, I think, a couple of events uh, that happened that could have led to, you know, rolling back funding and rolling back support. Uh, for example, the oil crisis in 1973 the 1980s structural adjustment programs that cut funding to social services, you know, uh, and many other things that we are yet to discover. Uh, but uh, the, the, the whole idea as we go through uh, these documents is that the idea of a social worker 
continues to be confusing and elusive to countries in Africa. Then uh, continuous professional development was regarded as an important role for the Association of Social Work Education in Africa and curriculum content included indigenous and international focus, thus balancing the external, internal and local was deemed important. And another thing we pick is the lack of professional recognition may be contributing to the fact that we are still having similar debates today. Social work is not standing out in its professional capacity. It stood out in the time of Asoya as it was seen as part of the role players to help with national government programs, to improve society through social development. The, the, the being independent, collaborate nexus. In other words, you know, social work seeing themselves as an independent profession and at the same time having to work in multi and transdisciplinary teams seems to be a huge ongoing struggle, you know, so that, you know, how do we work in interdisciplinary teams and transdisciplinary teams without losing our own identity, you know, as social workers? and so that we could both, you know, contribute to co-building a better society. Yeah, so I hand over back to Linda uh, to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Genestic. So I just want to end with a quote from 1974, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Mumanka. And he quoted this, in my opinion, the time has come for serious and critical re-examination of social work training in Africa. 20th century Africa expects social work to be creative and revolutionary. By virtue of their training, social workers should be able to make a positive contribution as members of interdisciplinary development teams. However, it is again necessary to reiterate my earlier concern that unless the profession of social work is prepared to take a new path, social workers will for a long time to come remain ineffective in developing countries. Thank you very much. Linda. And Genestic, um, thank you. Sorry, Yas wasn't able to join us. I've been watching to see if he's come back in and he hasn't, but uh, um, that was a, a phenomenal overview and somewhat salutary, isn't it? To, to look back, and those of us who can um, say, uh, I, I qualified in 1974, so it's over part of that period. Um, and what was what was happening and and how did it happen and what are the lessons for us with our institutions and of course what you you haven't touched on is um, what were the interpersonal relationships between the different people involved and and how was that going and we know from our own experience now that often it's the personal relationships which uh, make organizations and partnerships work and when those um, fall apart uh, that can be a problem so there are many challenging, intriguing um, elements of this story, which uh, is interesting to explore. Um, so thank you very much to uh, all of, of the, the team um, for, for sharing that with us. And I know you've got a lot more analysis to do and, and the, the project um, continues. Well, we now have to, to move on. Um, I see you're getting some thumbs up from colleagues around the screen. Um, just a, a warning, before the break, um, which uh, is a little way off yet, but before the break, we will take a screenshot and ask as many people as want to, to put their pictures and their screens on, their cameras on, so we can get a screenshot of, of the participants. But that's not quite yet, um, because now we're moving to um, the next uh, session, which is a video about the development of social work along the Zambezi, and we've got two colleagues who are going to present that. Um, Noel Marizzo from, um, uh, from Zimbabwe um, is uh, one of the contributors. He's the current president of IFSW Africa. 
Um, and uh, he's a registered social worker um, Zimbabwe has reg registration um, and uh, of, of social workers um, and he's uh, the uh, director of the School of Social Work at Midland State University in Zimbabwe. Um, so Noel is a very well known figure in African social work as is Joaquin who is the vice president um, of IFSW Africa and the chief executive officer of the Social Workers Association of Zambia. Um, he's had a, a long experience working um, there. Uh, 2005 it was secretary general um, and he's uh, been on the IFSW Ethics Commission. However, um, the challenge for us for later, because he's due to speak later as well, is that he's actually in Parliament in Lusaka at this very moment because the Parliament in um, Zambia is debating the third reading of a bill that will create a, a statutory association of social workers and statutory registration of social work. It's a very, very significant moment and the association in Zambia has been really active in doing this and he has to be there because there may be some discussions with MPs. So he's dashing in and out of parliament and uh, it depends where the, the, the discussion is, is whether he can be with us live. But that doesn't matter now because we are now going to see a video uh, from Noel and Joachim about the development of social work along the Zambezi. Good afternoon, um, those that are watching us. Uh, my name is uh, Joachim Mumba and I'm the regional vice president for Africa IFSW. Uh, thank you. My name is Noel Murizzo. I am uh, the regional president for IFSW uh, Africa. I am based in Zimbabwe. Joachim, what is our topic? Yeah, so our topic today is uh, the development of social work along the Zambezi, Noel. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Joachim. Maybe as a way of introduction, we are arguing and saying that uh, social work in Zambia and Zimbabwe uh, is a product of the Commonwealth through the British uh, exporting the profession. And we are saying Zambia and Zimbabwe are both former colonies of the British Empire, with the former being a member of the Commonwealth and the latter pursuing uh, rejoining the group. While the development of social work in the two countries is closely linked with the colonial legacy and uh, mirrors the British practice and legal system, social work in these two countries is being presented as being rich and linked to the three countries, that is Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Britain. So our presentation chronicles the rich and diverse historical development of social work in the two countries, linking it to the British experiences and practice. From this presentation, what will feature is the history, what you also feature is social work, Zambia, and Zimbabwe as our key words in this presentation. Joachim? Indeed, Noel. So uh, talking about Zambia, of course, uh, we need also to explain that when we mean uh, the development of social work along the Zambezi, we are basically talking about uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe because we share the border um, you know, along the Zambezi River. So in Zambia, you know, uh, social work was actually introduced, uh, you know, by the colonial administration. Uh, if you remember at the time of uh, colonialization, um, there was also some element of, uh, you know, industrialization, especially on the copper belt. Uh, there is a copper belt province that we, um, a lot of mines were developed. So there were a lot of uh, people that were moving from the rural areas to go and work in the mines. And then the colonial administration over time realized that uh, they needed, uh, you know, uh, social workers, you know, to work uh, in the mines and really to work as um, an element of partializing, 
you know the indigenous population of uh, the you know the, the the workers that were working in the mines but at the time uh, you know we did not have uh, indigenous social workers and so uh, expatriates were imported uh, mostly from the uk and from other developed uh, you know countries to come and work uh, in the mines uh, so they were working here as uh, you know social workers and they introduced actually professional um, uh, social work um, in the mines and then um, uh, over time uh, also we saw that um, the missionaries also had brought in uh, expatriates uh, expatriate social workers but then the need of social workers um, started growing over time and then uh, the colonial administration started to look uh, you know inwards to see if uh, they could uh, recruit um, indigenous social workers but since we did not have uh, trained indigenous social workers uh, the colonial administration started now uh, uh, i mean actually introduced uh, sometime in um, the 60s early 60s they introduced a program uh, which was uh, basically um, um, a very short course at Mindolo Ecumenical Center, where they started training indigenous, uh, you know, uh, social workers, and then over time also uh, they introduced uh, a program um, uh, at a place uh, which was later called Oppenheimer College of Social Services, which is now the Ridgeway Campus School of Medicine of the University of Zambia. So the Oppenheimer College of Social Services became uh, a kind of um, a, a regional training center, uh, you know, for, for social workers in Zambia. And they were offering um, a diploma uh, in social work. And uh, by then we started seeing now, uh, you know, a training of, in, uh, you know, the locals and who were mostly uh, um, taken up by the city councils and even after independence uh, that uh, you know college uh, continued uh, training uh, social workers but later when the university of zambia was opened in 1969 uh, the college of the openheimer college of social services was moved now from um, you know uh, the current ridgeway campus uh, school of medicine to the university of zambia where it became a department uh, of social work and, uh, you know, um, uh, in fact, it became the Department of so uh, Social Development Studies. Uh, so uh, uh, the University of Zambia now, uh, you know, um, improved on the diploma and started offering, you know, a bachelor's, um, you know, of uh, social work uh, a degree. And the elements of uh, a diploma was now moved to what was then called um, uh, PCC, which was the national uh, college for um, the, the yeah the national college for uh, for development, uh, where they continued offering a diploma uh, in social work. So yes, so I would say really that um, uh, social work has evolved, and that uh, there is a lot actually that um, um, has changed in regard to the form in which it was introduced in Zambia. No. Thank you very much, uh, Joachim, for that insight in the development of uh, social work and how it is linked to the colonial uh, past of, of Zambia. Similarly, social work in Zimbabwe was also tied to the colonial project. Social work was introduced by the, 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 the administrators as a way to react to the effects of industrialization and colonization itself. Mm. With workers working on the farms, in the mines, and in towns, and creation of towns, these came up with uh, various social problems. And to deal with these problems, the colonial regime uh, introduced social work as a form of social control. In our case, in 1936, social work was introduced through the employment of a British trained social worker by the name Mr. Kelly who was employed, Joachim, to come and enforce the school attendance program. Because at law, white children were, 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 were mandated and forced to be in school from the ages of 5 to 16. Therefore, to enforce this law, they, they, they employed a social worker to enforce this 
uh, law. So you find that uh, it, it, it was because of colonization. And we also find a British trained social worker, which we believe had a British uh, a, 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 a training and orientation of social work being introduced to come to Zimbabwe to, to, to introduce this program. But later you, you find that uh, we then also find a, a, a black social worker being employed in 1949 by the name Mr. Mwale. This Mr. Mwale Joachim links our Zimbabwean social work with Zambia. Mr. Mwale was a Zambian, mm -hmm. trained in Zambia at the Oppenheimer uh, College that you, you, you spoke about. And he came here now to deal with issues to do with juvenile delinquency among us, uh, the black children and black population. And it more so, as you'll see, issues around social work then were more of social control to assist the colonial regime and colonial project to, to perpetuate. Interestingly, in 1964, the School of Social Work, from where I'm speaking to you, yeah. was opened. Yeah. This school was headed by a father Rogers, a white social worker trained in Britain. Now, the argument that we are making is a link between Britain as the source of social work for both Zambia and Zimbabwe and also the source of social work practice from Zambia through the employment of Zambian trained social workers to Zimbabwe. And later, the opening of the School of Social Work being manned and social work education being provided by British trained social workers giving and training British curriculum of social work. Therefore, our link is that our social work in Zimbabwe and in Zambia is linked to the Commonwealth and linked to Britain in it, itself in terms of the curriculum, in terms of practice, in terms of introduction. Therefore, our argument is that the, the, the development of social work in the Zambezi and along the Zambezi and between the Zambezi or across the Zambezi is linked to British social work in curriculum, in practice, which is also reflected today. This is why you find that the, the Zimbabwean social workers, the Zambian social workers can fit in British social work practice. Why? We have perpetuated the, the curriculum. It is still linked to the British system and it is linked to the Commonwealth system, Joachim. Very interesting indeed, uh, Noah, very interesting insights there. And uh, we also see really that um, even then, when social work was uh, introduced by the colonial administration, uh, I mean, along the Zambezi, as we put it, uh, we see that they also took, uh, you know, cogniz cognizance of uh, the fact that there were some, uh, you know, indigenous ways of doing things, uh, you know, uh, in Africa and in these uh, in our countries. We see also that uh, the extended family setup as I think as you are going to elaborate, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, really working very well. Uh, we see that there were, you know, different ways that, um, uh, you know, families were supporting those that were vulnerable. And uh, uh, we see now that we are talking about decolonization of um, you know, social work in Africa, that we want to in, uh, in promote, uh, you know, indigenous knowledge, indigenous practices that would enrich, you know, the profession of social work. Uh, Noah? So we are appreciative of this gift that we got along the Zambezi in terms of the profession. But we are also cognizant of our own indigenous practices that we can also infuse and enrich social work. And we believe it is our argument in this presentation that there are also indigenous uh, practices and our way of living that we can also now bring to the Commonwealth and that social workers within the Commonwealth can also learn from and infuse in their practice. Let me ask you, Joachim, to talk about the concept of Ubuntu and why Ubuntu. It is one of the themes that we had last year as social workers that we were uh, uh, celebrating and talking about. And this is a 
African philosophy that we believe is a gift that we can give to social work and also to social workers in the Commonwealth. Joachim? In, indeed, I think, uh, you know, in 2020, uh, during the World Conference, uh, the African region, uh, you know, proposed um, Ubuntu as uh, the philosophy of Ubuntu as a theme that uh, should be, you know, incorporated and uh, taken on by uh, global world, by, by the, you know, uh, by the Federation and other, you know, social work partners. And uh, you know, Ubuntu uh, is 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 uh, is a philosophy that uh, you know uh, exposes the way of life of of, of Africans. Uh, I always give an example that uh, in our communities in Africa, a child does not belong to a particular family. A child belongs to the whole community. And uh, when there is some uh, you know uh, some some. Um, hunger, for instance, or there is some lack in this particular family, the community would come in to provide uh, support. And that is uh, actually the spirit uh, of Ubuntu. There is actually interconnectedness, interdependency, uh, inspired by the philosophy of Ubuntu. And we feel that uh, the philosophy of Ubuntu can really enrich our profession can reach our profession within Africa, as well as, uh, you know, across, uh, I mean, uh, out of Africa. So I, I think that is uh, very critical. And we really appreciate that, um, you know, the world has uh, incorporated uh, Ubuntu as, uh, as, as a philosophy where, where the, you know, the, the profession can learn from. Noel? Thank you, Joachim. So this recognition, that indigenous knowledge systems are also important in social work is one of the gifts that Africa can also give to the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Examples of how we can operationalize Ubuntu and how we operationalize it as social workers in Africa, for example, include but not limited to the care of children and orphans and vulnerable children. In our African setting, there is no concept of an orphan. Children belong to the family, and the family is the community, for we are because of the larger community. Therefore, it is not surprising that social workers along the Zambezi would work with the family and remember what others out there in the global north would call the extended family. To us, it's just the family. So it would work with the family in, in, in the care of children, for we do not have orphans. And we believe should social workers in the North also adopt this concept, it can also be of benefit to uh, the people that you work with and social work as a profession. Another example, Joachim, is the care of the elderly or yes. older persons in communities. In our concept, we did not have uh, older people's homes or yeah. care homes. We live with the elderly, we live with our parents. In fact, they are not elderly, they are our parents. We are connected with them as much as we are connected with our ancestors. So to us, having them and staying with them is just a blessing. So we stay with them. So these are concepts we believe the global north and the Commonwealth social work community can also benefit and also share with Africa. Joachim? Sure, thank you so much, uh, Noah. And I think uh, maybe from this, our conversation, uh, we've been able to um, uh, you know, uh, raise some issues which um, uh, the social workers in the Commonwealth have uh, you know, um, uh, learned and uh, that will continue uh, having such conversations uh, going forward, Noah. Thank you, Joachim. Much as our presentation focused on social work along the Zambezi, we do appreciate that social workers along the Zambezi can also learn from the Commonwealth other practices and best practices and how uh, their social work practice was also interconnected with Britain and other Commonwealth countries. It was a pleasure, Joachim, to present this uh, presentation of social work along the Zambezi.
for we argue that it is just but a river. It is a, a river on which we uh, find ourselves along, but we are one person. Thank you so much. Thank you. So many thanks to Noel and Joachim. I was watching the chat and uh, their, their presentation provoked um, some, uh, some reactions um, there, which we might want to pick up um, later on in the, um, in the, in the panel um, discussion. I'm just checking um, our timing. Um, I think we need to move straight into the next session, but there may be some time for a little more um, discussion at the end of this session. Um, so thank you to, to Noel and Joachim for, I think, emphasizing the importance of local and indigenous experience, but also acknowledging um, the legacy of um, colonialism and the debate that then has to flow from that um, and what is the direction that, that um, African social work, um, whether it's along the Zambezi or not, which needs to go. I'll just tell you my own story about the Zambezi. I was in Africa as a young person, um, as a volunteer teacher, and I actually was hitchhiking across Africa um, from Nairobi to um, Lusaka and, and beyond. At that time, of course, there was Rhodesia, and um, I was um, hitchhiking across the Zambezi on the Chirundu Bridge, and I uh, went across to the, uh, the, the Rhodesian side, as it was then, and presented my passport, and they said, well, how much money have you got? And um, I said, I've got various cash, but I didn't have any Rhodesian money. Then it was um, the, the, the uh, sanctions were applying, and my friend and I were refused entry. It's the only country I've ever been refused entry to was Southern Rhodesia. And I had some pride. I had a document that says I was a prohibited immigrant of Southern Rhodesia. And I had to walk back across Chirundu Bridge, across the Zambezi. And I was thinking, um, will they let me into Zambia? Or will I spend the rest of my life on the bridge across the Zambezi? Um, that's a real story. Anyway. Um, I don't think that Joachim is here. Joachim, are you, are you here or are you still in Parliament? I think that you're still in Parliament. So um, we're going to have to handle the next session um, slightly differently. I see Noel is here, um, but um, uh, that's a phone which I somebody else will answer. Um, so the next session, we're developing the ideas of Ubuntu. Um, and we have um, two, uh, three speakers. Joachim was going to chair this, this next panel, but I will continue to introduce two colleagues. Um, Fembalile Makanya from the University of KwaZulu-Natal KwaZulu in Durban, and Eleanor Hendricks from the U University of Fort Hare, also in, in South Africa. Um, and uh, just picking up, uh, Fembalina, um, I'm just checking if she is here because I know um, Fembalile, are you, are you there? Um, can you put on your video? Because she had to go to hospital with a medical emergency yesterday. But um, George? David, um, joking has left a message. I am back in, just stepped out of parliament with good news. So ah, all of that up. I see it there. Thank you. I've just, uh, I closed my, um, my message. Joachim, I, if you are there, we congratulate you on achieving your parliamentary success on um, regulation of social work in Zambia. Do you want to tell us what happened? Hi there, Joachim. Hello. I think we can hear you. Hi, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm connected. I'm in the car, uh, in the car park, but my connectivity is it's uh, really bad, so I'm I'm really getting you in uh, in pieces. It's you're breaking, so I don't know whether I'll be able to communicate. Well, tell tell us what happened in Parliament. Historic. Ah, okay, very historic indeed. Uh, what happened today is really I'm even shivering because I can't believe it. Um, our bill has passed the third reading, and Parliament has even adjourned. And um, apparently uh, there are very good um, signs that the president is going to sign. Uh, we are calling it the Social Workers Association of Zambia Bill. 
and uh, in terms of mode of operanda, uh, we will be operating the way the Law Association of Zambia is operating. We are not going to have a separate council from the association, so it's a hybrid kind of arrangement for us. So we are excited. I'm super excited. Um, you know, the process that started um, sometime in 2005, coming to fruition today. <clears throat> well. Congratulations. It's not often, Philip, that you have history made in a history seminar, but uh, um, we, we are a, a part of that. And I know Joachim has personally played a huge role in it with colleagues in, um, in Zambia. So many uh, congratulations. Um, perhaps, Joachim, we'll leave you with your celebrations and I'll introduce our, our next colleagues. But um, if you come back um, later on, we'll be pleased to, to, uh, to speak to you. Um, so thank you very much, and I'll go on to Thembalile, um, who um, has, um, I don't think she is here, but she has managed to send us a video, I think, Gemma. Um, so um, congratulations to her for doing that. Um, and we'll now hear a video about Ubuntu from Thembalile, who is from the University of KwaZulu-Natal Kwa in Durban. Ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all. My name is Tendelise Makanya. I am from the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. The topic for my presentation today is indigenization of social education and practice, which is a call for decolonization in South African higher education. Okay. Sorry, I will just project this so that everyone will be able to see the presentation in full. We will all remember that even though there have been student protests across the country in South Africa, but the year 2015 and 2016 marked the most uh, year that have highlighted or that have reminded us the fact that even after 25 years of democracy, they are still a call for the undoing of the injustices in the institutions of higher learning in South Africa. In South Africa, social work education and training have been affected by, by colonialism and apartheid. And as mentioned in the above picture, the years 2015 and 2016 of the South African higher education institution have been grieved by the hashtag must, must fall student protests. Those protests have been toward free decolonized higher education. Students have called for conceptually relevant curricula that will be free from the colonial influences. The need for university curriculum to be based on the inclusive needs and interest of learners and the selected content of the curriculum to be based on the life experiences of students for conceptual relevance. The centrality of African interests, values and perspectives pre must predominate, uh, which is the need for an African centeredness in in, higher in African higher education. The study that I'm presenting here today, uh, it, it's adopted social conductionism paradigm, which put value into the social world mm -hmm. as influencing the current experiences. It was also the case study of a one institution in South Africa, higher institution. The ethical clearance was obtained from the university and the strategy of inquiry was an individual and focus group interviews. Uh, the study interviewed 22 uh, participants, 10 were postgraduate uh, students and 12 were social work practitioners. But all participants had studied in the university where the study was conducted. The research participants were recruited by means of positive snowball sampling, which are non cooperative sampling techniques for qualitative research. The findings of the study demonstrated that despite the transformative policies that allow all students inclusion in the new dispensations of higher education institutions in South Africa, poor students coming from disadvantaged backgrounds still suffer from academic exclusion in South African universities. Pedagogically teaching methods and learning in social work education remain colonial, thereby excluding African interests. The research participants spoke of their learning experience at the university as characterized by alienation in classroom discussions due to 
the domination of colonial languages such as English, lending barriers to technological ignorance, Western dominated models, and the absence of a model that address the growing unemployment of social work, of social work professionals. English dominated classrooms, for example, a lack of belonging, non participation or withdrawal, lack of proper enunciation or elocution, intimidation, insecurity, and incompetence were some of the feelings that characterize the research participant experience with the English language usage during class engagement. One participant um, said this, being taught by someone who's been to speak English from the beginning of the lecture till the end was very difficult for me. I hardly followed or understood what was being said. It was difficult to even raise a hand to ask a question or to partake in class discussion. I was also scared and intimidated by my classmate as I thought I was the only one who came from a rural area and who had difficulties with understanding the English language. Other findings, learning barriers due to technological ignorance among poor students. The participants reflected on how they were academically alienated in their first year of study due to their inabilities to use computers or the internet. For instance, Nonja uh, mentioned this. In high school, it was only the learners doing common subjects that were allowed in computer labs and trained about the use of computers. So those learners had the privilege of having computer access. What about physical cl class and others? No, it was only learners in commerce that had the opportunity. They did not allow us to attend computer trainings. So I was not familiar with the computer. The worst part is that I was accepted and registered late at SU. So SU is the pseudonym for the institution where the data was collected. Mm -hmm. So I did not even attend the orientation. I was honestly clueless. Researcher curious about what? Mm -hmm. sure. About computers, learn use of internet. Mm -hmm. That's the sad part. Although the university accepts students to register late, but those students are not catered for in terms of orientation, use of lens, and, and what what and, and what form. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I was among those who were unfortunate. So I registered around March. I registered manually in the faculty office and no one told me what next. But I asked around and people told me about the notice board located in one of Hypercast buildings where you can check your lecture venues and times. I checked that, but still I had no one to direct me to the venues and what not. And I knew nothing about mentors. Researcher, I hear you. How did that impact your learning, Nonja? Yo, Tembe, it was a mess laughing. I think there was a lecture that I was supposed to attend in the morning. My very first lecture, I had students saying it is or was canceled. And I was like, why or how did you know it canceled? And they said, I should check my emails. Remember, I did not attend orientation. So I was clueless. I was sitting to myself laughing. Where can I check emails? I didn't know. I asked myself, what is an email, my God, or professional researcher? How or when did you discover about emails? I asked around, asking people where I can check emails. They told me about the land, and I was like, what is that? Nonjan researcher and others laughing. So, like, I had to learn all those things at the university, and it was not easy getting into the land and not knowing anything about the computer. So, like, the whole process was so difficult for me because I did not know. I literally had to learn to type at the university. I just couldn't master all the technological requirements up until I literally just learned the typing and the computer from other students. So I think that was the main challenge for me. On the other funding, students complained of Eurocentric or Western dominated literature in social work modules. For instance, there is an, a module which they use an example of, which is an anti-oppressive theory and practice. And they say, this module have the potential to allow graduates to deal with past injustices. However, participants were critical about the Western literature updated in this module. One student, in, for instance, said, I cannot remember all, but what got to me is the one that talks about cultural imperialism. As Africans, we take pride in our culture and we cannot say everything about our culture is oppressive. 
showing respect for our elders and not talking back on them. For instance, we do not see that as oppression, but for someone who is outside of the culture, it is oppression because that respect is seen as silencing our voices. On the other founding, absence of the module addressing the unemployment of social workers, which is more prevalent in South Africa. Participants in the study reported that the modules offered in the social work curriculum at SU did not directly respond to issues of unemployment. They pointed out how the university curriculum did not even provide practical guidance, strategies, or skills that, that could adequately deal with the issue of unemployment among graduates. The lack of modules that focus on management, business, and entrepreneurship orientation were the concern of the research participants in the study. In conclusion, a lack of developing indigenous languages in social work education at SU hinders effective practice for social workers working in indigenous or African communities. The impacts of new digital technology on academic outcomes must also be taken into consideration and evaluation must be conducted differently based on the social economic diversity of students for inclusive academic advancement. This is vital, considering that most African students entering university come from deprived economic backgrounds and poor basic education. Accordingly, there is a need for the establishment of developmental technological supports at the university level. The above discussion does not contend for the complete exclusion of Western global literature in teaching and learning at HU. But the argument is on the centeredness of African perspectives in social work education. The responses of the research participants suggest that Western philosophies and experiences have little or no applicability or relevance to South African social work education and practice. However, the above argument does not suggest the overreacted importance of business. Remember the points where participants were complaining about the lack of skills that can deal with unemployment. So that argument was, was not suggesting the overreacted importance of business school graduates over that of other disciplines or professions. Instead, the research has been argued for a comprehensive curriculum within social work education that address not only the literacy of graduates, but places equal focus on financial entrepreneurship education as well as business management skills. Thank you so much for your time and listening uh, to my presentation. You can make comments or ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tembalile. And uh, I'm sorry that um, you aren't able to be with us in person. Um, and uh, that uh, hoping you're feeling better and uh, you've recovered from the problems that you've had. Thank you so much for getting the video to us, which was um, really excellent. Um, very interesting challenges there. Um, the core principle of social work is start where the client is. I was taught back in the 70s, and um, that's about empathy and understanding. And the same needs to apply to students as it does to anybody we're with. So um, some important messages there. Um, about uh, support for students, but also uh, getting alongside people in the reality of their lives. We're now going to move into a, another presentation from Eleanor Hendricks. And Eleanor, um, I know is here, I've seen her um, name on the list. So uh, welcome, I, I can see you there. Uh, welcome, Eleanor, you're a senior lecturer in social science and humanities department of social work at Fort Hare University. South Africa, but you're also a specialized family uh, counselor and your research interests include social work and social media, adolescent reproductive health, gender based violence and conflict management. My apologies about my phone going in the background, but it's now time for you to speak. So over to you. Thank you so much, David, and good day to all my colleagues. Today I'll be presenting on decolonizing classroom social work through conceptualizing Ubuntu, social work and its values. 
So I'll start with the introduction. In 2015, South African universities were plunged into a crisis that marked a watershed moment for their future orientation. Universities became engulfed in nationwide student protests against the philosophical, structural, and cultural foundations. Despite two decades of restructuring, South African universities have been unable to shed the yokes of colonialism, apartheid, and patriarchy, and to recenter on the pan-African mission and vision statements that many of these institutions proclaim. Next, I'll be giving the social work definition of decolonization. Within the context of social work, Hagman 2015 defined decolonization as a process of both sides of the unequal and unjust relationship, actively challenging it through considering the knowledge, skills, and values that make up social work theory and practice. Thus, decolonization requires a vigorous dismantling of, of the deep roots of its continue, continuing dominance and an unpacking of Foucault's theorization of the relationship between power and knowledge and Said's presentation of an anti-colonial project that contests the dominance of a Western discourse in the production of knowledge. In social work education, decolonization or the lack thereof can exert a great impact. The training of social workers mainly through Western dominated models and knowledge to address local challenges is regarded by key players as ineffective and it could be argued that this merely maintains the status quo of inequality and disempowerment. Green 2019 states that there is a growing realization that social work cannot continue to be conducted on the lines that are not really applicable to local conditions. We cannot continue to rely on models of social work intervention borrowed from the West, which are not fully relevant, adequate, or functional to the South African situation. Authentication of social work education. Recognition of practice experienced by social work practitioners and educators in various settings. Recognition of existing inequalities imbalances and areas of prim primarily Western dominated practices, which require address dissemination of research into local needs, problems and culture. Collaboration by educators and practitioners towards building local models for social work practice and training and fundamental changes in social work by re-examining and restructuring content in the light of newly accumulating practice experiences. Ubuntu and social work practice. The imagination of alternative Ubuntu social work values is an attempt to fill the gap in proposition of alternatives or new ideas in social work, which reveals decolonization scholars are decreeing. The pursuit of decolonization is viewed as a continuation of social work's advocacy on social justice and of progressive elements within the profession that challenge homogenic forms of practice. A decolonizing approach that espouses disrupting the status quo in social work education and practice requires that we confront and reflect on the question of how we have come to where we are in social work. Ubuntu values for decolonization of South, 
social work practice and education. The first value then would be value of hospitality, interlinked with connection and genuine relationship building. In social work, the value of African hospitality can be drawn on in teaching social workers how to work with people and communities from African contexts. Respecting and demonstrating hospitality helps in building connection and genuine relationships between the social worker and the people they work with, which would be the clients and the communities then in this instance. Our hospitality is intertwined with showing generosity and assisting those who may be in need. Need here can be anything, need for information, need for guidance, need for someone to talk with, need for direction, time, need for food, safety, shelter, healthcare, and any other basics of life. This kind of willingness to share is without expectation of reward or payment. The next value then would be value of the power of community. Ubuntu social work recognizes, embraces, and builds on the popular of community in meeting human needs, especially in the rural areas. In African context, for example, the contradiction came from the disregard of rural urban divide that exists in Africa where rural areas remain neglected by government and non-government organizations. The limited presence of state intervention means that rural communities predominantly rely on their own self-organized community initiatives and systems to address the socio-economic issue arising. Thus, social work education should highlight the need for service provision in rural areas. The last value is the value of interconnectedness with the environment. Through Ubuntu philosophy, Africans are taught by their family and community about the value of our interconnectedness as humans with the environment. Through our Ubuntu totems, we learn that we have a responsibility to care for the environment and all the creatures in it. We care for them as they care for us. We see the identity ourselves through the environment and all its compositions. Indigenous knowledge on interconnectedness is passed on to us by our parents and community from a young age. When we start to learn about our clans and totems, hence the emphasis on green social work as of recent. In conclusion, decolonization is about cultural, psychological, and economic freedom. For indigenous people, with the goal of achieving indigenous independence, through decolonizing the social work curriculum and employing indigenous values, it affords the right and ability of indigenous people to practice self-determination over their land, cultures, political and economic systems. Thank you colleagues. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Eleanor, and helping us to think through the specifics of Ubuntu and social work and for colleagues who are not used to this field, um, there's a growing body of literature um, uh, about Ubuntu social work written by African um, academics and practitioners, which um, Eleanor has drawn on there, um, but uh, is also there for people to, uh, to look at. <clears throat> Well, we've, we've come to the end of this section. If you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Um, hold on to them because we've got um, time during the panel session at the end to um, look at this in more detail. Um, but thanks, Elena, and thanks, uh, Thembalile, for the video. And thanks also to Joachim, um, who may be able to hear us in his car. Um, but um, thanks for the news, which was exciting. 
uh, and you talked a little bit about Ubuntu in your earlier video. Before we take a break, I said we would get a screenshot. So um, I hope that there will be a number of you who are actually here still in person and not just leaving your cameras or your, your, your uh, computers on and walked away. Um, thank you. Nice to see all the pictures coming up. Um, and uh, we'll uh, in, do whatever you like to do for photographs. And uh, uh, Gemma is taking a picture and we'll tweet that later on as well. So thanks to everybody and let's go for it. Getting a nice um, picture there. Um, I think probably we're okay, Gemma, is that all right? I think so. So let's hope, um, yes, Gemma says yes, it's good. So we're taking a short break and we're, we're coming back. And after the break, we are moving across. Oh, here we go. Thank you, everybody. Um, welcome back. Just saying it was nice to have music in the um, uh, in the intervals. It's not something that I've got the, the, the skills to organize yet, but um, um, Jane Shears from Bathwell British Association suggested I should sing, which I think would be something that we'd best avoid. Um, but uh, it's uh, nice to have different cultures uh, expressed through music if, uh, if possible. I'm just filling the time, just so people know, we've, we've um, had up to 70 people. Um, I've been watching the participants and people have been coming and going um, a little. Yeah, OK, I've seen the note in the chat. Please don't sing. I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's uh, a lot um, of people coming and going. But we had get, uh, almost 100 at uh, the peak um, yesterday. And we've registered 300 people coming and going and other people will see the video. So um, we feel that was um, far exceeded our original expectations. So that's really excellent. Right, so I think it's um, time for us to move and uh, uh, move on to um, the other side of the Atlantic, um, to the Caribbean and uh, then to, um, uh, to Canada. And uh, uh, my first um, step is to, uh, to welcome Sarita Buchanan, um, who is head of the Social Work Training and Research Centre at the University of the West Indies um, in, in Jamaica. I should say that the um, short biographies of all of our speakers are available on the Institute of Commonwealth Studies website. There's a link there to um, the, uh, the biographies. So if you want to catch up with anybody, um, you can do that. And um, if you are wanting to contact anybody individually, um, colleagues have um, said that their emails can be shared. So um, contact um, Gemma at the Institute, um, who has been uh, sending out the, the contact information. Um, and uh, uh, she can provide emails. Some people have put their email addresses in the, uh, the chat as well. But obviously, if you do that, remember that it goes to everybody and it may be recorded. But Sarita, who's in um, Jamaica now, um, I hope that uh, you're, I see your co-host so you can share your screen. And uh, thank you for joining us and over to you. We can't hear you at the moment. Okay, um, are you seeing the screen? Um, we're seeing a blue screen with a single icon. I saw your, your slides. Oh, okay. There they go. Okay, great. That's so it, that so it's all over to you and nice to see you. Thank you so much. You know what happens when you're using two screens. I was wondering where it was sharing from. Okay, great. So, I, you know, David, when you said earlier about the music, I just thought, wow, I really should have, you know, shared some Caribbean music for us to enjoy this morning. But another time, you need to give me some notice for that one. So,
So good morning, good evening, um, from wherever you're from this at this time of the day. I'm going to share just a little bit in my session about social work development in the Commonwealth Caribbean. And I wanted to start by just sharing um, a photograph of Dr. John Maxwell. And some of you might be familiar with him. Um, and he's a stalwart and a visionary in terms of social work in the, the English speaking Caribbean. And Dr. Maxwell is really, I'm sharing him this morning because a lot of the work that has been built on this sort of history that has been documented builds on a lot of the work that he has done initially. And we have other persons who I think are with us today, Let Me Rock, Peter Ann Baker, I'm not sure if she's in the room, in at Cambridge and a lot of other scholars who have built on John Maxwell's work. So I just wanted to highlight him. He's retired. He worked at the University of the West Indies where I'm for, um, coming in today. Uh, but, you know, he, he couldn't be here with us today. And so I just wanted to highlight that, that a lot of the work started with him documenting some of the histories of the social work development. So today my presentation will take the form of highlighting the different stages of social work development in the Caribbean, uh, looking at uh, pre 20th century, just briefly, um, the colonial years and post abolition years, then the early 20th century uh, to 1938, which is a, a century after the abolition of slavery, uh, post 1938, up to the 1950s and then 1960s to the end of the 20th century and then on to 21st century development. Don't mind that I have covered all of these areas. I'm just going to touch on a little bit of each area so I won't have you here sitting too long. Okay, so let's get right into it. So the pre 20th century colonial years and a lot of this, this form, the earliest forms of organized welfare. And in listening to some of the other presenters that I was able to catch this morning, um, I do realize that there are definitely similarities and commonalities in the development of social work across the Commonwealth. Um, and, and at this period, there were basic survival needs that were taken care of in the sort of welfare system that, that um, happened at this stage. It was state-sponsored poor relief, um, so which formed part of the earliest forms of public assistance, you know, so adaptation of Elizabethan poor laws across different areas of the Caribbean. And of course, after what you found is this time is that the poor laws only applied to a minority of the population, it didn't include the slaves. And so after 1838, which was the abolition of slavery, there was a massive need for relief provisions. So what we saw in this, this period was a sort of religious charity, um, which was forming basic education for the slaves. And post-emancipation, the religious charity expanded um, to initiation of primary education and primary health care, and later institutional care for needy children. So we also saw in this period a primitive form of community development. And I have community development and development in quotes there because the, the word development um, speaks to a sense of building capacity and enhancing people's self reliance. And this was not what this sort of community engagement happened. We had commissionaries who were looking at helping persons in free villages and land settlements. We also had free society, friendly societies, burial schemes, which were form, uh, basic forms of social insurance at that time. So the philosophy around all that period was more about material support, basic physical uh, needs. Uh, it was not about developing any coping and building capacity. So when you move to early 20th century in up to 1938, what we found is that there was um, lim limited appreciation for the need for trained professionals at that time. Uh, even though there was a willingness to serve in social services and volunteer activities, as we mentioned through the church and other volunteer charity organizations, such as was seen in Jamaica in the Charity Organization Society, um, similar to the London Charity Organization Society of 1850. But this did not lead to any development of social services and social work professionalization during that period. What we, what we further saw in that period were things like the Salvation Army in the 1920s that came to four pension schemes in places like Barbados and differences such as that. 
um, development in, in children's services and youth services, but not in a meaningful way to be able to move beyond just the physical needs. Post-1938 to 1950s, across the region, we had the West Indian Royal Commission, which investigated the uh, labor unrest and social um, situation, social and economic conditions in the West Indies. And I believe that Barbados had the Dean Commission earlier in that period as well. And the recommendation coming out of this morning commission was for improvement in education, health services, housing establishment, um, labor assessments of labor departments, land settlements, and further social welfare services in the 1940s and 50s. And what we saw here started later in the 50s and moving to early 60s was a concurrent period of political will and self-governance across the English-speaking Caribbean and development of government social service sector and NGO strengthening um, that we saw during that time. There was also the first appointment of social welfare officers. And similar to what was presented by some of my colleagues, there was training provided uh, by Britain. Um, the, in, in the Caribbean, we had between 1943 to 1953, seven six-month training courses between that period. Uh, what we realized is that there was Similarly, the training was later being conducted to the University College of the West Indies, which is now the University of the West Indies, where I currently work, and they started in 1948. There were a few persons who got the opportunity to study in Britain, um, London School of Economics, um, Edinburgh, different places, um, and other places to do a two-year diploma at this time. And of course, this period saw greater development of child services. Um, we saw development of this idea of community development starting to take form. And this was more so in Jamaica, in the in say Barbados and Trinidad, you had more so casework sorted to take form in these periods, and the emphasis was more in those areas. From the 1960s to the end of the 20th century. The climate was now more open to the need for skilled professionals to conduct social service work. It wasn't just about charity organizations and volunteerism and the church's influence, but it marked a turning point in the development of professional social work. We had the development of professional associations across the region, Barbados, and I know Sharon, I saw her earlier, Rose Gittens will probably make mention of that later on. In the 1960s, Barbados developed their association, their professional association. In Jamaica, it was 1968, and Dominica and St. Vincent and other countries in the region, in the English speaking region, uh, followed suit. The Association of Caribbean Social Work Educators, I must pause to mention this one because. In 1993, the association was formed uh, towards developing uh, a sense of the, the knowledge that was being generated in the region and understanding the shared histories of the Caribbean, but also appreciating that or type of social work, even though we said earlier the curriculum was being taken from University of London and the other places, but that the theories that needed to be developed and the sort of scholarship and the discourse needed to be brought forward. And so in 1993, the association had their biennial conferences, which happens obviously every two years. And so I know there has been some delay in having that, but that has helped so much in terms of the development of social work in the region. And of course, I will share two of the oldest programs in the region. I mean, there's a lot of work being done now in terms of developing uh, the information and documenting the histories of the region. Because, and that is why I want to thank Dr. Maxwell, because he initiated a lot of that. University of Ghana is doing some work in that area, and I know Dion Frank was on the call earlier. And just to share how it is that our realities have been shaped and how it is that different organizations are and universities are taking social work forward. Um, so these are some of the two as documented, um, the two oldest programs. In 1961, there was a two-year professional certificate program offered by the University of the West Indies. And 1963, the second oldest recorded um, documented program, the four-month residential paraprofessional social work course, 
at the Social Welfare Training Center. And I now currently head the Social Work Training and Research Center, which is its predecessor. So, and we're celebrating 60 years. You can check us out and look at some of the activities that we'll be doing for this year. And we continue to do some of these courses that enhance paraprofessional training. Um, which is very important to social work. And if we have the time in the, the, the panel discussion, we could possibly speak to some of that. Why, you know, in terms of inclusion of paraprofessionals in the discourse in terms of social work assistance in practice and how we do that sort of training. So what we started to see in this period was the further professionalization and development of social work education. So we have the Bachelor of Social Work that developed um, University of West Indies started there in 1970. And we saw the transition from the curriculum from a more British focused program and theoretical orientation to a more Caribbean um, realities and more cultural relevant um, content and curriculum um, as we went on. University of Guyana in 1970, College of Bahamas 1981, um, University of Belize 1996. And then throughout different universities and community colleges across the region, we saw different masters and PhD programs. And one of the things I wanted to highlight is across the region, the importance of field education um, during this time became very important, understanding the different realities in the Caribbean as opposed to a more colonial um, orientation, understanding the needs of the people at that particular level, the development of, of Caribbean identity and understanding of community um, identities was important. And so this field education became very important in the curriculum and is still, and still continues to be very important. We saw internationalization of social work education but also understanding cultural relevance and sensitivity to diversity. There was a push towards looking at global standards for social work education as well, with an understanding that social workers in the Caribbean region are often um, transported, as I like to say, um, to global markets, not just in the UK, not just in Europe, but also in places like Canada and places like the US and other parts of the world. Australia now is pretty big. And so we understood the importance of internationalization of our social work curriculum um, in that way. So and I know this might be a little dated because there might be many more universities now, but I know Let Me Rock and myself did some work earlier. And in 1920, in 2013, um, there were over 18 tertiary level institutions in over 19 countries in the regions offering social work training. Now I must highlight that University of the West Indies operates in 18 Caribbean countries. We're a regional institution. And so we've been only counted once. So there are about 17 or more other tertiary institutions that offer social work training in the region, in the English speaking region, the Anglican Caribbean. So social work education increases the focus on teaching skills and working with vulnerable populations. We realized the curriculum was moving now in the 21st century towards looking at areas of social justice, identity, um, and increasing concentration on trauma informed practice. Uh, the Caribbean Journal of Social Work, an important turning point in our history in the Caribbean in 2002, this journal was started as a journal of the Association of Caribbean Social Work Educators and is produced out of the Social Work Training Center of the University of the West Indies and the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. This sought to increase Caribbean scholarship, um, looking at how we theorize social work in the region and how that influences practice and you know, to develop and impact the sort of practice that we want in the region. And this was a very important thing that we did. Um, we'll highlight a little bit more on that. There were efforts to promote professionalization and maintain relevance and recognition because one of the, the challenges that we continue to see in the region is that social work positions across different ministries and non-government organizations are occupied by psychologists, sociologists, and other allied professionals. And so this idea of recognition and understanding the importance of professional social workers in this entity is continues to be one of the challenges we face. And we have seen actual improvements in this area, but we continue to look forward to greater development to ensure that this idea of recognition 
and understanding of social work becomes very widely known. Um, online social work education, and I know other universities because of the pandemic took this on, but the University of the West Indies started that in 2009, um, and that in itself has created different discourses around um, social work. Uh, professional codes of ethics and practice specific to the Caribbean. Before, a lot of the teaching in the curriculum was around uh, global social work codes of ethics. And I know that Barbados, I think the, the association has created one, and Jamaica created their code of ethics in 2012. And I know other countries have followed suit in terms of creating their own um, professional code of ethics and practice um, in the region. That is culturally relevant. So where do we go from here? And where are we today as it relates to social work um, and social work education? And I, I put some of these questions here because these are some of the areas that we have been discussing, that we have been looking at um, closely. Online social work education, and I put there as a teaser, simulated practice experience. With the pandemic, we had different um, scenarios across different universities, as did the rest of the world. Um, and I put VR technology there. How is it that we look at these different things as it relates to virtual reality? Can social work, and these are all questions, can social work not just look at technology informed practice, but actually use the technology for practice? Does this have implications for how we practice? Does this have implications because of it's a professional um, area? Uh, can it be done at all? And these are discussions that are happening right now because of different um, aspects of technology revolution. Licensure and or registration. Now in the region, we, have, we don't have licensing as yet. And I say as yet because that continues to be a robust and rich um, discourse and, and discussion among scholars and practitioners, whether to do licensing or to do registration or both. Um, and so we do not yet have that and the discussions continue. The Association of Caribbean Social Work Educators, again, and professional associations important role in legitimacy, relevance and recognition of the profession, it becomes very important. And of course, just to highlight again, the Caribbean Journal of Social Work, which started in 2002, uh, which had its first online version, which is volume 14, um, that was put out just the end of last year. And so that should be congratulated 20 years after it was published. And I think a journal such as this and the Association of Caribbean Social Work Educators uh, is it very important to stabilizing and promoting legitimacy of the profession and promoting professionalization and greater understanding throughout the region of social work and greater appreciation, I should say. So uh, that is all I'll share at this moment. I know I'm probably pretty close to my time. Um, you can check out the journal and uh, all the work that happens in the region online. And we, have, we should be having conferences coming up pretty soon. Uh, given the state of the global world and this pandemic. Thank you. Sarita, thank you so much for a <laughs> lively and, and uh, succinct summary of um, some complicated history and um, really uh, interesting um, themes that are coming out that resonate across different continents. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned John Maxwell. I'm old enough to have met him when he was still at the University of the West Indies and he was uh, the leading figure um, at that time, and it was good to talk to him and to, to know that he is still around. So please pass best wishes to, to John, and it's good to see um, Let Me Rock here. Sharon Rose Gittens from Barbados will take part in the, um, the, the panel later. I know there are other colleagues from the Caribbean. But thank you very much indeed for, for that um, overview. And now we're moving to the final one of our presentations. Um, Jake and I had a conversation four hours ago, Jake, when uh, we were testing things. Um, so you've been very patient, um, but it's really good to, to finish in Canada and in, in Calgary. Um, Jake has um, a really impressive background. He qualified even before me, I think it's fair to say, um, in 66, I qualified um, in uh, 74, but um, uh, Jake has been the president of the uh, Alberta College of Social Workers, 
um, for eight years, um, a real lobbyist for um, uh, the, the, the strength of social work in, um, the, in the province of Alberta, similar in a way to what Joachim is doing in Zambia at the moment. Um, and uh, he's now a retired social worker, but still, like some of us, can't give it up. So he's still involved in um, a whole range of uh, voluntary activities. But you're going to talk to us about um, developments in Canada, Jake, and um, so we're welcome. You were one of the first to contact us after we put out the call for abstracts and our last speaker. So I don't know whether that's something, but over to you and thank you very much. Hey, uh, I got to figure out where I've got to go here. Um, just a sec. Yeah, down the bottom, you should have a share screen button. That's it. And you're there. Absolutely perfect first time. Okay. Uh, how do I enlarge it now? Let me see. You're, you, that, that is it. You can just, oh, that's okay. perfect. Okay. Well, let, let me begin uh, uh, by uh, explaining why would a retired social worker uh, get interested in social work history? Uh, during the time I was president of the Alberta College of Social Workers uh, and lobbying for including uh, social work in the Health Professions Act, uh, I was asked by a senior official of uh, the Department of Health, uh, why, where did this term social work originate? And uh, I thought it was probably in the 1800s, but I didn't know anything more specific than that. Uh, but on my way home, I phoned Gail James, Gil, Gilchrist, Gail Gilchrist James, who was a good friend uh, and very much, uh, for those of you who knew her, involved in IFSW. Uh, she, however, referred me to Dick Ramsey, who I believe is around. And uh, he must have checked uh, one of the social work dictionaries because he told me it was somebody by the name of uh, Simon Patton. Now, being a bit of a cynic uh, at times about American social work, I thought, who is this Simon uh, Patton? Well, he was an unhappy uh, student of economics at some American university. But a friend had uh, written him about a program in historical economics, I think it's called, uh, at the University of Hale, Wittenberg. Uh, the university that Martin Luther started in 15 something. And I thought, okay, so he's German, he's been in Germany for some time. I wonder <clears throat> about the name uh, and did he pick up the German term for social work uh, at that point in time? And my suspicion is that he in fact did. Besides that, he didn't coin the phrase social work uh, because subsequent inquiries uh, I found uh, at as early as the early uh, 1800s in a, a several newspapers that were online and uh, keyword searchable. So that had triggered my interest in, in social work and particularly in the history of uh, social work in the province of Alberta. And uh, I want to begin with this note about that history. Uh, Douglas Francis uh, uh, wrote a paper in a book uh, uh, about uh, six, uh, six different survey histories of Alberta, uh, ranging over a period of about 60, 70 years. Uh, one of the first ones is a three volume history, uh, which he described as uh, basically an attempt to compare the province of Alberta, which was constituted legally in 1905 with Eastern Canada. And it took three volumes to make that point. Uh, <clears throat> the other one uh, that uh, interested me was uh, uh, Jenny Kerber's suggestion in a book that's much more recent, uh, Writing in the Dust and Reading the, Prior, uh, the Prairie uh, into Environmentally. The reason that's important is because the prairies uh, are and were the homes of Canada's in, a significant number of Canada's indigenous people, and they have a view of the land that is very different from uh, the way uh, 
uh, us Europeans uh, think about it. And my third point would be uh, to remember the good words of Paul Ricoeur, uh, the French philosopher uh, who wrote that we shouldn't forget that, that <clears throat> it's really testimonies, uh, whether they're written or whether they're oral. Uh, they're all testimonies that we can test, but at the end of the day, they're the stories we tell. And I take the newspapers as being uh, a first effort at writing history. <clears throat> on top of that, I, my, my take on it, on social work history is that it's connected either directly or indirectly to the presence or absence of uh, good social policy or public policy. And Gail Willis in her 1995 book makes that a very good, makes a very good case for that. Because she describes <clears throat> the development of the Toronto Social Planning Council and efforts at social planning as a contest essentially between business and the owners of businesses and the efforts of social workers. So keep that in mind. But the real history of, of, of social work uh, is planted, I think, as I put in a submission, uh, is planted in Western Canada with the coming of the fur trade in May 2 of 1670, when a royal charter was issued by the government of, of, or the King of England that gave the Hudson's Bay, Bay Company the right to economic development and economic development at that point meant uh, strictly furs and particularly the fur of beavers. The historian uh, A.J. Ray uh, explains that really the, the fur trade was the most for pervasive force influencing the economic and political development of Western Canada between 1660 and 1870. 1870 is particularly important because that's around the time that Western Canada saw the influx of, of uh, um, the Europeans who came to Western Canada in large, much larger numbers than before because of the train and because the discussions around the treaties uh, were underway. <clears throat> At its best, <clears throat> the fur trade really, uh, according to Ray, amounted to a partnership for the exploitation of natural resources, meaning the furs of beavers. It's a period of significant transformation for the indigenous people of Rupert's land, which is what this land that the Hudson's Bay acquired uh, it was named. It's also the time that uh, particularly the French fur traders uh, um, influenced uh, the way in which the trading of furs took place because the Hudson's Bay Company required the Indian and indigenous people to come to their forts primarily uh, located around the Hudson's Bay. But the French went out. And as a result, uh, many of them became uh, married with, uh, with the Aboriginal women, which is the origin of the Métis Indigenous peoples. Uh, but the transformation created the conditions that followed uh, the fur trade. And the fur trade <coughs> uh, really uh, as uh, Robert or uh, Harold Innes, I believe it is, uh, wrote in, in, in his uh, economic history of Canada, uh, <clears throat> which really uh, covered, or pardon me, which really is a point he was making about uh, that the staples is, has been the, the main export, uh, particularly of Western Canada, but also uh, in the early years of Canadian development, the fish were included in, in, in that uh, staples theory as the dominant economic uh, activity of uh, the people who came to live in the West. <clears throat> One of the uh, 
interesting things uh, that has come out as, as other historians have begin, begun to look at the history of Western Canada is that the role that women uh, played uh, as active agents, uh, and it's particularly the women who married uh, the fur traders, who uh, basically uh, helped them sustain themselves through the winters because of their familiarity with sources of food, et cetera. Uh, and uh, the other author that, uh, uh, that uh, contributed to that is Aretha Van Herrick, who has written a book called uh, 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 The, uh, oh, come on. The, <clears throat> I, I'm sorry, the, the name of the book escapes me at the moment, I'll think of it. Uh, <clears throat> so here, here's kind of a quick summary of the economic and social development of Western Canada, and I call it an uneasy relationship. It begins, as I said already, that with the history of the fur trade, Confederation of Canada, uh, <clears throat> the US purchase of Alaska, and because of the Canadian government's fear that the that the purchase of Alaska from Russia uh, could lead to them trying to uh, obtain access to Rupert's land. And there were some discussions uh, among American uh, at the time that having bought Alaska, the next logical thing to purchase or to acquire would be Rupert's land, which would have given America uh, access from uh, basically to the north or the Arctic coast, as well as the east and west. The promise of the railroad to uh, the west coast, of course, facilitated uh, trade and travel. And uh, it also necessitated the development of treaties uh, with the indigenous people uh, to uh, increase the population uh, for one thing and to claim the land for homesteading purposes ranching and farming. And finally, oil and gas and coal and lumber are really the staples of Western Canada uh, at this point in time. And I hope to show that those are uh, important. The other, oh, excuse me, I need to go back one. Um, the other thing that has had a significant influence in Alberta, is the 1834 poor laws. Uh, in the rush to uh, impose law on the, um, the Western provinces uh, the, after the acquisition of uh, Rupert's land, the government of Canada imposed on the Northwest territories the 1834 uh, uh, poor laws. The interesting thing about that is that <clears throat> It, the laws, the poor laws were carried forward into Alberta uh, through the Alberta Act of 1905. And all, although it's been supplanted, it's never been repealed. And this, the significance of not repealing it, even though it's been supplanted, is that it, it captured an approach to public policy uh, that remains in, pact, uh, in fact, in, uh, in effect today. If you were to take a look at some of the social policies of Alberta, you would quickly see that income support programs divided into categories for the unemployed or not able to work uh, to uh, a group of persons who have disabilities and a third group uh, of uh, seniors. What's significant is that is that the rates vary on the rates or the amount of the income varies with the category. So <clears throat> the seniors uh, uh, are are the best off in terms of the income uh, they qualify for. Next are the persons in Alberta who have a disability of some kind. And finally, within <clears throat> the ongoing income support program, there are divisions in terms of those who are able to work and those who aren't able to work or those who can't find a job. So you can look at, at, at other social policy or, or social policy in Alberta in that kind of a context.
what has also emerged is is uh, and probably most recently is that civil society uh, is one of the things that the current government is very much in favor of developing. It's the last quote on the three here. Uh, it's by uh, the Premier of Alberta who defines it as, what is the best way for civil society to flourish and to in turn enable human flourishing, especially so that those who are the most vulnerable are cared for. To put it another way, government is at the service of a flourishing civil society. That does not mean there's no role for government, but it means rethinking it. And it's, it's a serious, uh, the implications are serious because social policy uh, and social programs are with primarily within the purview of the provincial governments, not the federal government. Even though federal government is much involved in funding uh, because they have the power of taxation, whereas provinces have a much lower level of taxation. So when you read the language that the Premier has proposed here and you put it in the historical context that precedes the, the, the uh, two quotes by the quotes that I have, uh, you understand that what he has in mind is <clears throat> rethinking <clears throat> the constitutional provisions of the responsibilities of uh, the provinces of Canada. Here's some arbitrary um, usages of the phrase social work that I quickly found as I was preparing this. Uh, you can see the London Times, 1887, an obituary refers to Lords Idesley uh, as, as a social worker because he was being recognized in the obituary for having established a reformatory for the destitute and criminal children and as the chair of the House of Commons Committee on Destitute Children. That's not entirely disconnected from what we would think about social work now. In 1874, the, the <clears throat> New York Times uh, refers to it as uh, in connection with the YMCA, YMCA uh, programs, the Young Men's Christian Association. Not to be outdone, uh, the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper, refers to social work in the context of domestic work of women. And I uh, look through the Calgary Herald, which is uh, one of the local newspapers in Calgary, Social work is used to describe a donation of $1,000 by the city of Victoria to fund a food and shelter home operated program by the Salvation Army. And in many of the others that I didn't bother quoting, uh, the Salvation Army is frequently referred to. Uh, I learned about the Salvation Army uh, first in, in my first job when uh, it was affectionately called the Sally Ann. It was that it was called that because the people who were my supervisors were all former uh, military men uh, who had served uh, in, in in Europe uh, and uh, so knew that the um, Sally Ann, as they called it, uh, uh, was generally available if they needed something. The earliest social workers that I've been able to identify uh, with the assistance of a colleague uh, in Edmonton, uh, the first credentialed social worker was hired in 1918 to lead the Edmonton, Edmonton's Board of Public Welfare. She was a graduate of New York School of Social Work. And as I note here, she was likely the first social worker in Alberta with a degree in social work. Uh, she was recruited by the Montre what was called the Montreal School of Social Work when it abandoned, uh, when it, it, the McGill University abandoned social work uh, for a period of time. In Calgary, uh, the earliest person referred to as a pioneer social worker was Marion Coots Carter, who came to Calgary from Ontario 
initially, some of the literature uh, that I was able to find uh, suggested she was, had come to Calgary directly from uh, um, England, but uh, that seems to not to have been the case. But she was involved with uh, establishing the ca first Calgary uh, Local Council of Women. Uh, she worked on child welfare issues, uh, on establishing the Victoria Order of Nurses, which, by the way, was uh, uh, established by the, uh, the spouse of a governor general of Canada uh, uh, during the time that Marion Coots Carter uh, was in, uh, in uh, Calgary. And the Imperial Order of Daughters of the Empire uh, is another one of Marion Coots Carson's involvements, and we'll come across that uh, organization a little later. Uh, because of her activism in Calgary, and she's reported to have been involved with a, a substantial number of Calgarians who would get together periodically in the early 1900s for debates around politics and uh, social issues. And uh, she and a sister were uh, uh, some of the primary uh, motivators of that initiative. So social work's uncomfortable, uncomfortable relationship with public policy begins. In the early 1920s, uh, uh, the reports of a government, uh, the annual reports of, of government, uh, in one of its first uh, references to social work, notes that the government was going to hire, I think it was in 1922 or 24, that they were going to hire a social worker to work with children uh, who had disabilities. But in the next year's report, they note they didn't uh, hire the social worker because they had to uh, use the money to expand the facility. So the first uh, social workers who were actually hired uh, were involved with the uh, implementation of Alberta sterilization legislation. There was a big debate in the 20s uh, within the government party, which at the time was called the United Farmers of Alberta, located primarily in the southern part of the province, around the issue of eugenics. And uh, when this uh, party, the United Farmers of Alberta was elected, uh, and they uh, began to implement uh, the, uh, the first eugenics uh, legislation in Canada, and I think more broadly. The social workers they hired were expected to travel around the province to identify persons for sterilization. Uh, and I was able to acquire from a colleague some of the uh, data. Uh, most uh, common were the Indian, Métis, East European, West European, and in that order, uh, people were targeted. I, a, a good friend of uh, uh, my wife and mine uh, over many years uh, is another couple, and they, <coughs> they had taken on the role of uh, supporting a person who had some, has some develop, minor developmental disabilities. But he was uh, sterilized by the Alberta government in the 1950s uh, when he was 15 years of age. And it was against the recommendation of his, his doctor who had protested this, but <clears throat> because of the sterilization legislation, uh, the government uh, and his agent proceeded with the sterilization. Greg, I'm <clears throat> just sorry to interrupt, especially as we're getting to uh, a really sensitive and important part of the history, but I'm, we're, we're running out of time. I'm just wondering how much longer you've got. Not very. Okay. So two minutes. <clears throat> I'll, I'll skip this one. Uh, in 1943, there were three major reports by social workers. I think it's important to note them. Note that they were social workers. Uh, Leonard Marsh, the report on social security for Canada. Uh, he, he had worked on the beverage report and taught social work at, at the University of British Columbia. Uh, Harry Cassidy, who uh, was the first dean uh, 
of the School of Social Welfare at the University of California, Berkeley. And I should tell you that when I interviewed two people at the university, at that particular university, neither of them knew that he was the one who had uh, started this uh, university, uh, the School of Social Welfare. And Charlotte Whitten, uh, the, the dawn of ampler life. And she's well known in Alberta for her report on child welfare. And you can see here uh, some of the things that were going on in Alberta uh, that led to her, uh, uh, her report. Uh, it was initiated by the Imperial Order of Daughters of the Empire. Uh, and uh, it was a highly critical report. The provincial government established the Royal Commission, one of the few in, in, in history, uh, to criticize her report. In point of fact, the report, which was written by a lawyer uh, by the name James Mahaffey, uh, actually uh, uh, supported much of what she had to say. Uh, <clears throat> here is a, a bit of the background uh, to the creation of uh, the organizations uh, that uh, currently uh, you find in Alberta uh, dealing with social work. They began uh, through an initiative by the Canadian Association of Social Work. And at the end of World War II, uh, soldiers who had entered uh, social work programs and others, uh, a significant number of uh, women as well, uh, created branches in Alberta, uh, two branches, one in Southern Alberta located in Calgary and a Northern one in Edmonton. Out of that came the Alberta Association which was initially formed as a registered society in 1961. It's primarily the responsible, uh, responsible for having started the, uh, the work necessary to establish a social uh, work program. Initially, it was called the School of Social Welfare. And the, the lawyer I mentioned actually uh, was a friend of the premier at the time, and he uh, played a key role in creating uh, uh, the, the conditions for the creation of the School of Social Work. I'll skip this one. <clears throat> I can't uh, omit uh, this social workers and the role they played in the 60s scoop. Uh, social workers were prominent in uh, service of the government's policy uh, related to child welfare. And uh, in a 2016 uh, report by the Children's Advocate in Alberta, uh, one in 10 children in Alberta were of Aboriginal heritage, but made up 69% of the children in the child welfare system. And <clears throat> The child welfare advocate uh, uh, made, makes the following comment, comment. Socioeconomic factors, the legacy of the residential school system, and the 60 scoop, differing worldviews about family and responsibility for children, and distrust between Aboriginal people and governments. And that, in many ways, certainly still relates uh, uh, relevantly to the current uh, uh, ongoing uh, relationship between the Indigenous communities and the social work profession as agents of government policy. Professional regulation, just very quickly, uh, the Alberta Association of, Six, uh, of Social Workers uh, formed in 1961. In 1969, the the social work uh, social workers were regulated voluntarily through uh, the Social Workers Act, and in the last uh, 10, 10, 15 years, uh, it's been the Health Professions Act. Uh, which is now uh, under uh, social work is now controlled by the what's called the Health Professions Act. The registration is mandatory for persons with a social work degree or a diploma and provide who provide services to the public, plus those who teach uh, social work uh, 
uh, you know, and have a social work degree. Thanks. And I'll leave it at that. That that's been really helpful, Jake, and and to draw out the consequences of the um, residential school system, the public inquiries that are going on, and we know that um, it, if you can just click to stop sharing your screen, it's the the green button. Um, oh, there as well. Um, but we know that the that when, oh, you but, when you stop sharing the screen or or perhaps um, Gemma can take away the, the host privileges for that yep. great. So the, the residential school system and the, and the inquiries about the deaths and the bodies of children that have been found in residential schools is a huge issue in Canada at the moment. And um, is really significant. We're handing over to the um, to the panel, which Philip is going to chair. But I just asked Lynn, um, uh, Sarah, uh, Vickery, um, who's put the link to the. Um, if you can come online, Sarah, um, the the link to the bulletin of the Social Work History Network, and Sarah will just very very quickly say something about the bulletin and people who've contributed to this um, series. Are welcome to uh, to send submissions um, material to you, Sarah. But just very very quickly because we're running out of time. Yeah, thanks, David. <clears throat> Not just for the opportunity to talk about the bulletin, but for having arranged this conference has been absolutely excellent. Uh, but very briefly, because I know you're short of time, the um, the bulletin is something that I edit as the coordinator of the Social Work History Network, which is a network that's in the United Kingdom that David chairs currently. Um, we've had it chaired by Terry Bamford before David and then uh, Keith Bilton before him. And when I became the coordinator quite a while back now, um, one of the kind of roles was to put together a bulletin and the first issue came out in 2014 and we've tried to do at least one every year since then. Uh, I've put the link in the chat so if people want to look at the current one which actually came out just a few weeks ago now in March and as you'll see it's a collation of articles across kind of a range of topics but we also try and involve um, not just different contributors, but images as well. We try and try and get pictures as well as words, as it were. Um, so the volume eight's just been published. And as David said at the beginning, we're hoping perhaps to have a special issue from this conference in it as well. So if people are willing to contribute, please do get in touch with me through the network and uh, we'll get that together. And you can make that contact through the website of Social Work History Network at uh, King's College London.